Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Silver Webinar with the Metals Investor Forum. I am Peter Kraut, author of The Great Silver Bowl, editor of Silver Stock Investor Newsletter, and I'll be moderating today's event. We are three newsletter writers who will each present the opportunities that we see in the silver market, and that will be followed by three outstanding junior silver companies. Each uh, of our presentations, um, that is by the... Uh, by the companies will be followed by a short Q&A, both with us and with the audience. And that will be followed by the next company and their Q&A. So time permitting, we may do a general Q&A um, open to all at the very end. So please be sure um, as questions pop into your mind, uh, things that you'd like to know uh, more detail, um, either specifically about companies or about uh, the silver market in general, please be sure to post any questions that you have in the Q&A section, uh, uh, chat section uh, on your screen, and we will do our best to address those. So I am going to get started after me will be Chen Lin with his presentation, followed by David, and then we will jump to each company in sequence. Thanks uh, very much. So today I'm going to tell you why I think we are at the start of a new silver bull market. Um, investors saw what happened last year with stocks. Bonds were no better. Um, stocks were down about uh, 20%, bonds as well. And so this is actually a comparison to what happened in the 1970s and what when stocks don't perform and don't perform for an extended period, what that means for investors. And inflation is certainly something that they need to take into account because it can be pretty dramatic in terms of returns. So the left chart shows the nominal return on the Dow from 66 to 82. And although that's pretty lousy, um, it's pretty innocuous if you compare it to uh, the after inflation effect. So the chart on the right shows what happened to the Dow if you take into account inflation over those 13 years or so. And the Dow is actually down about 70%. So that's pretty dramatic um, if you think of what that does to your pur purchasing power, even though you think that you know, your portfolio would have been actually flat after thir 13 years. A big point, I think, that uh, at least in my view, that we need to account for, and probably over the next several years, perhaps as much as a decade, is that the U.S. dollar has peaked. Um, it's been in a uh, secular, um, a long-term downward trend that has had uh, multiple lower highs, and that certainly is a definition of a secular trend, even though you have these counter trends that can last uh, a couple of decades. But uh, 1985, the U.S. dollar index peaked at 160 in 2002 at 120. In last year in the fall at 112, we're currently around 104. I think we may actually have a small counter trend rally um, right now that could bring us perhaps to as high as 105, 106, 107. But I think that's temporary. Um, and that we're actually heading closer to uh, a previous low that we saw um, over the last few years, which was 90 in the U.S. dollar index. So uh, perhaps 95 will be the first target, but 90 ultimately, perhaps over the next year or two. And although inflation has been cooling a little bit in some uh, very specific sectors, a little bit of the food area has uh, seen some cooling. We've seen a bit of cooling in energy as well. Uh, but I certainly don't think inflation is over. Um, this is the what I see as the first wave in multiple waves. Uh, I think that one of the big problems is that many investors who perhaps are just too young to have experienced this uh, previously and just don't have that in their um, in their toolbox are looking at what's happened recently in terms of inflation. See that it's starting to cool a little bit if you look all the way over here on the right. And are comparing that to the last big wave of inflation, which was late 70s, early 80s. And that was taken care of by much, much higher interest rates, um, levels that we are unlikely to see again today, given our debt levels. Um, and I get, think that's a mistake because they see inflation having cooled off that last time and having basically moved sideways and be innocuous for about uh, 35 to 40 years. 
in my view, what we're seeing right now is really uh, the, the equal to, in some ways, to the first wave that we saw in the late 60s. And uh, that was followed by a couple of more and uh, sequentially higher uh, ways of inflation. So I think we really need to be ready for that in terms of our investment choices. So for me, all of this makes a very compelling case for silver. Um, if you look at uh, what's happened in uh, the precious metals area, well, since last September, we've seen a big uh, move. The dollar is down by 5%. Gold is up 8%. Silver is up about 20%. And the XAU, which is Gold and Silver Miners Index, is up about 20%. So investors really are starting to look at alternative assets. If you look at, this is one of my favorite charts because I'm sure if you ask the average investor, where's the best place to have been invested over the last, say, 22, 23 years, they're going to tell you stocks. Well, stocks did okay, up about 200%, according to the Dow and the S&P, but silver has been up 370% and gold is up 520% over that same time frame. So granted, you've had a lot more volatility, but if you can absorb that volatility over this time frame, you've done considerably better than you have in stocks. Um, silver, the performance since 2000 is actually quite uh, impressive. This is the returns in all of uh, the major currencies globally. And in the US dollar since 2000, the average return um, in those last 23 years has been 9.9%. In Canadian dollars, it's been 8.5%. And if you look at the average of all the major currencies, it's been 9.5% uh, in silver over the last 23 years. So that's really something to um, to consider when you look at uh, uh, whether if you try to decide whether you think silver is in a secular bull market or not. And with all of this, we're facing some of the highest demand in decades for silver. Uh, Chen will have a few words uh, more to say beyond this. I am quite sure later, but um, on a more sort of macro view, uh, the Silver Institute revised numbers recently in terms of the demand for uh, silver last year from 1.21 billion ounces to now 1.24 billion ounces. That meant global demand was up 18% last year. Industrial demand was up 6%, led by the green transition to solar and EVs. Physical investment was up 27, silver jewelry up 29, and silverware up 72%. And, we're, and all of this is facing uh, in the face of multi-decade record deficits for silver. So in 2020, we had a surplus of almost 70 million ounces, 69 million ounces to be more specific. Last year, um, the number was initially uh, estimated at a minus, at 194 million ounce deficit. That was recently revised to 253 million ounces. And again, I'm sure Chen will have more to say on that, but if you go by just these numbers, the swing from 2020 to 2022 was a 320 million ounce swing from surplus to shortage in just two years. And the Silver Institute thinks um, we're going to see deficits like this persist for years going forward. And what is in many ways leading the charge in silver demand has been um, the demand for the solar panel industry. Solar consumes 12% of the supply of silver every year. Um, that's a huge chunk of just the industrial demand. It's the single most important industrial demand um, factor. S solar represents just 3% of global electricity output and the International Energy Agency forecasts that by 2030. So we're just eight years from there that the solar output will actually be up eight and a half, maybe nine times from current levels. That is, those are the most recent numbers that I have seen. So if you do the math, uh, the current demand of one uh, of 12% of annual supply, and you multiply, so that's about 140 million ounces, let's say roughly currently, and you multiply that by almost nine times, you're at almost the entire annual supply of silver currently. So that and that would be within just the next eight years. So we're going to see a, an extreme crunch, I think, coming in the uh, in the silver uh, supply, uh, and that's going to be led by solar. We haven't even accounted for all of the other things like EVs, electronics, medicine, and the list is endless. So um, again, this is just a uh, sort of a high level overview. 
Gold and silver miners right now have been doing really well. I mean, you know, sentiment uh, is maybe not the highest if you look at uh, the gold and silver markets, but uh, that's a little bit misleading because if you look at where gold and silver are, let's say average over the last few years, and you look at the average over the previous few years, both metals have done really well. Um, and that has really helped profits with uh, some of these major miners. And so they're, they have, they're holding some of the highest cash levels in their history um, right now. And I think that they're going to really start putting that to work. We've seen that with uh, Newmont making a bid for Newcrest. We've seen with um, B2 Gold looking at uh, taking over Sabina. So I think there's a huge M&A opportunity that's coming. If you look at the last uh, phase of this, that was in the late uh, 2000, so 2009 um cash flows soared uh from like 2009 into 2011 2012 um and then the green that was that's the white line the cash flows from operations the green lines are the aggregate of the of acquisitions that uh, took place so there was a lag but there was a, certainly a big bump in acquisitions uh, mergers and acquisitions now we haven't seen that in this last phase where we've seen uh cash flows uh, soar again and move sideways recently, but still, uh, we know that uh, the miners are, are really generating fantastic cash flows. It's the single best performing sector in the S&P. Really high dividends are actually are being paid as well. And I think that there's this huge gap here uh, that is going to be closed uh, and it's going to start reflecting what we saw in the late 2010s, early 2011 and forward for a few years. Um, and I think that we're going to see these larger operators, even some of them, maybe the mid-tiers, start to look to acquire companies outright, look to get involved in projects. And I haven't even talked about scarcity, the scarcity factor where you could see a lot of uh, manufacturers, especially solar panel ma manufacturers, start to take a very serious interest in silver miners to secure offtake. Uh, and that can take all kinds of forms, whether it's offtake agreements or outright uh, participation in projects or even outright uh, ownership, partial ownership, or full ownership. So this gap is going to start closing. And I think that really creates a big opportunity uh, with the, especially the juniors and the mid tiers um, in this, uh, in this whole space. So I talk about all of these uh, topics in my, in my book, The Great Silver Bowl. It's available in audio, paperback, and Kindle. And if you want to follow me, you can do so at Silver Stock Investor. And I'm also on Twitter and LinkedIn. So next up will be uh, Chen Lin. And I um, cede the floor to Chen. Thank you, Peter. And uh, great presentation. I think uh, you, you hit it on the bullseye that the demand is going up so fast that uh, actually I'm going to report even last year's uh, pre presentation, last year the estimate is still too low. <laughs> so last year <laughs> the biggest deficit, it was still too low. Okay. so. This is my uh, favorite topic. And uh, there's a chart in the middle, that's from actually Bloomberg and then another Chinese a research firm. When I show it to, uh, you know, Philip Baker, the hackler CEO, he's, oh, this looks like another 99 years of silver bull market. His point was uh, when Koda invented the film with the silver in that, that started 99 years of a silver bull market. So we are at the very beginning. If you can bear with me, you can see where we are here. And then we're going up. This is the most conservative, most conservative, absolutely most conservative estimate. There already article came out. I have a very reputable magazine, PV magazine. This year, they think 300 this year to 3,000. Yeah, in 10, less than 10 years. That's exactly echo what Peter was saying that the solar panel demand is just rapidly going through and it will take most of the silver output. So where else can, can you go, right? So the silver has price, once we see the shortage, when investors see the shortage, silver price will have an explosive move. So uh, for this seminar, we want you to prepare for that. Okay, let me... That's my disclaimer. Okay, you feel free to read that. It's for entertainment only. And then just a little bit um, uh, disclaimer for myself. Okay, I am manage my family asset. I 
run portfolio of including biota, including energy, or besides the uh, mining and gold and silver. Okay, and uh, I'm a more trend watcher. I exit gold and silver 2012, and when silver was $12 March 2020 upon the table when last year, $18 upon the table, I have very uh, conservative demand of silver. Okay, I'm looking at because uh, sometimes, you know, Indian investor want to buy. I see that's not a real demand because when silver go up $5, they will sell. <laughs> so those that can change very rapidly. What I see is um, the silver has been byproduct for decades. Uh, there's a day, and then the producer dump excessive silver to the market. So we want like a solar panel, to take away all these excessive silver and then silver price goes up, then that's where the bull market starts. Okay, that's uh, that's what I see. And then we I see potentially go silver ratio back to 10. So this is a um, international energy agency. Oh, I, I misspelled that. Uh, so they came out last year with a new estimate. Okay, that's in, this is uh, what they have last summer and then in the fall, they already start to have accelerated cases. Okay, so uh, this is a, a PV solar panel. Uh, you can see they already upgraded significantly just in a few months. So this is what we have most most recently. Uh, you see the first, you see the internet, just go back a page, I show you. International Energy Agency thinks this is originally seen this year at 200. You see that? And then now it's more 260. And then the latest forecast, okay, latest forecast from very reputable uh, research form already pointing to over 300, some even say 400. Okay, just this year. You see how much dramatic growth it is. So I had a, a pretty frank and heated discussion with the metal focus group that Silver Institute was using their data to give the forecast. I had past two weeks, okay, I had a discussion and dispute with them on their methodology and what is real demand of silver in the photo, you know, in the PV industry or basically solar panel industry. So basically I can tell you uh, very, um, very uh, I'm very happy to report. Okay, so they will be another upgrade coming to increase the solar panel demand of silver that's coming for last year. Okay, this year will very likely to be too low. They already acknowledge because this, uh, their number, if you look at it, is way behind other reputable firm. And also, I, I, if you could drill down to details, I mean, I told them, I mean, that there's a methodology, we have differences, right? I think the solar panel, when they, is created when they manufacture silver already used, right? They're using a little bit more backward looking. They want to see how many solar panels was installed and then just for inventory. But those are not very accurate in my opinion, because if I buy a solar panel from Home Depot, I put back on my truck and so I go camping, those are those counted as in store. So it's much easier or much more accurate to count when silver was manufactured in a solar panel. Even that, is still under report silver usage because um, you make a panel, usually a few percent are bad panel, right? The silver are used. So those are defi deficient, you know, de defective panel. Some are sold for less price. Some are scrap, uh, very few recycled. So that's even that is still under reporting the silver, silver demand. So I want trying to get as accurate possible, the real silver demand in solar panel. And then I can tell you, there will be significant update in April. Remember what happened last November when the Silver Institute came out with a new number. If you recall, the silver went from $18 to $24 in very short time period. So investors should pay attention, which will have a major report coming on with revision coming in April. Again, exactly like the Peter said, uh, the, the solar PV, this is a, a international energy agency that reports. So they will just overtake by 2027, that's only a few years from now, will be the, the 
the most uh, uh, energy source for, for, for worldwide, right? So the reason is the solar panel cost is getting lower and lower. It's a, the cheapest way right now to create, to, uh, to produce energy. Plus the advantage for solar panel is you don't need to feed it with natural gas. You don't need to, you know, you don't need to depend on weather, how much water it is, or even in the coal base, a lot of pollution. So you just build it, it will, it will start generating electricity. You may need to clean it a, a week or two, right? Depending on the weather condition, but that's pretty much low maintenance. So this this is a, this is what I put in the first page, okay? Uh, I try to put it out and that's where the demand coming. So, uh, so and uh, you know, uh, I, I try to try, go through that uh, as soon as I can because I'm running out of time. Okay, so I'm just show you, oh, that this is a, a, by International Energy Agency. Okay, what is the metal are needed uh, for the solar panel to reach? Remember that was old report. So the, the 2030 will likely be reached by 2026, even 2025, okay? So how much silver will be taken away? You can see that, okay? Uh, other metals also, uh, but you know, another metal called tellurium, that's you want to take a look as well. But uh, in general, that's, uh, that they also have a lot of demand for copper, okay? Indian and uh, magnesium. So silver is obviously will be the biggest uh, beneficial for the, uh, one of the biggest for the demand of solar panel. Okay, so I'm just trying to go through that as soon as I can. So this is a loading factor. A lot of people saying, oh, the, the, the silver, uh, every year the solar panel used less silver. Yeah, which is true. You see, especially in the beginning, it dropped a lot. Now it's getting flat. And I'm just telling you the new technology, which start this year called Topcon, they will add another year layer of silver. And then the, the silver loading will be increased dramatically. Okay, so new technology use a lot more silver to increase efficiency. This year will be the year of Topcon. If you look at the, this is a Topcon, and this is what they use. This is Chinese. Actually, this one is more accurate because it's the actual factory they're using. So uh, you can see that there is almost a 40% 40 increase. And the next generation solar panel, which will start next year, uh, I use it even more. Okay, it's more than double the silver, but uh, there's always, always talk, always uh, effort to use less and less silver. So it will have a big jump and then gradually go down. You, you understand that. So they always go by, by this kind of chart. So uh, solar panel go ma mainstream and I just, uh, I, I just want to see, uh, to tell you that uh, the top con is taking off, HAT is next year. And uh, so, so this, this, all these, uh, I don't have too much time. And uh, so this is the best chart. <laughs> it's from our, our friend and Crestcat. Uh, I'm sure Peter has a very similar chart. We are just on a great cup and handle about to break up. And I see silver will blow through 50. Okay, there's no triple tops and hopefully we'll see triple digit. That's just as Peter predicted. Okay, and then we see this, uh, you know, most selling finals. So that's that's where we are. And uh, so all the juniors are very, very undervalued. And uh, this is a Canadian market where we are. Okay, so um, so that's uh, that's where we are. And then you can go to my website, champix.com and partner with my good friend, Jay Tyler. So now is our friend, uh, David Morgan, it's all yours. Well, thank you, Chen, and thank you for the Metals Investors Forum. I always appreciate doing these. Uh, Peter, you hit a home run. You really did. Chen, uh, you hit a triple. <laughs> <laughs> you both did a great job. Uh, I want to make a couple of comments, and this is uh, probably sounds egotistical. I don't mean it to be, but I've been in the metals market for basically my entire life, and the reason I moved to silver more than gold was in the early days, some really great minds. The gold guys were really smart and taught me a lot. But it seemed as if to me, my perspective was the silver guys were even smarter. And they even dug deeper. They even went further. And I've always had a heart for the underdog. Silver has been the underdog metal for a very long time. 
But if you look at who started, uh, let's say, the silver movement in the late in the 70s, Jerome Smith, the Aiden sisters learned technical analysis from Jerome Smith. Harry Brown, who was libertarian presidential candidate for two different terms, uh, worked with Jerome Smith. And so anyway, it's all good. It's all run happy family. I'm partial to silver. Um, this is my outlook for 2023. I'm a macro thinker. I'm not going to belabor the point too much, but the uh, way the system is structured is an upside down pyramid. And the pyramid is the most stable structure on the planet. So that implies an upside down pyramid is the most unstable system on the planet. And that's exactly what we have. This comes from the extra pyramid. It's been updated by my friend, uh, Trace Mayer, who's a doctor of jurisprudence. Smart guy, what he shows is the power of mining gold and silver. A uh, silver nuts put a silver tip on that gold uh, triangle. Regardless, there's very little actual money compared to the amount of currencies, of course, what's in government bonds and what's in the muni bond market, real estate market. And of course, derivatives are at one quadrillion right now and climbing. <clears throat> Central banks have been uh, moving into the gold market for a long time. They discounted silver to a non-monetary asset in the crime of 1873, and very few, if anybody, holds silver as a monetary asset in the in officialdom. But that doesn't negate the fact that it's known to be money in, in many countries and by many populations. So I always like to show this chart. And this is um, when Warren Buffett bought silver. Forbes magazine produced this. What's important about this chart is the lie has been taken out. As Peter did in his uh, presentation, he showed the actual nominal look at the stock market. And then he did the inflation adjusted look in the stock market. So it looked nominal, it looked flat. But if you inflation adjusted it, you were actually in a downtrend. This gives you a clear picture. Of course, these are $1998. Let me specify that. But from time this chart was made, 1344, I should say what's shown here on the chart, 1344 until 1998 is accurate. So you see that the all-time high happened in the year 1477 at $806 silver. So for a crackpot like me to say we're going to triple digits like 100 or 150, <laughs> well, in historic times, certainly not. Now, I want to give a caveat here because the obvious sometimes isn't that obvious to some of us, of us that overthink things, such as yours truly. But it took me a while to determine when does silver do the best. And it was obvious that it does the best when it's money. But in most cases, something that does multiple tasks is more valuable. If I'm going to hire a secretary and all she can do is a word program and nothing else, I'm going to pay her 30 bucks an hour. But if someone can walk my dog, do word, do dictation, schedule meetings, get a new interview, uh, edit my film and all that. I'm going to pay her more. And that's an analogy for silver because not only does it still function as money in several jurisdictions, but almost anything electronic or electrical requires silver. It's essential. It cannot be substituted. So back to the chart as I digress. You can see this mark over where my cursor is. That's $200 silver. And that went from about 1564 to 1764. So for 200 years, we had $200 silver. So again, if I'm saying 100, on a historical basis, <clears throat> I'm actually under predicting the possibility of silver. Drop down here to 100, that's about 80 for what, another 150 years. Silver's demonetized 1873. You see it fall off a cliff. You see the spike here in the Hunt Brothers which it got to a gold silver ratio of 16 to one, the classic or monetary ratio. Then you see down here on an inflation adjusted basis, this was an all time low, silver at 473. Well, wait a minute, David, let's not think and talk about nominal price because silver was 22 cents an ounce in the Great Depression and 22 cents is smaller than 473. True statement, that's the nominal number. The true inflation adjusted number is 473 is the cheapest silver's ever been in real terms. And guess what? That's when Warren Buffett bought. Now, he bought 130 million ounces of silver, but the exchange is only able to deliver 90 million ounces. 
So what happened to the other 40 million ounces that he had ownership of? Well, it came to him in slowly over the last couple of two more years. And the lease rates on silver were somewhere around 17%. So who do you think was capturing that yield on silver of metal that doesn't yield anything? Probably Buffett. Remember, Buffett moved his silver to London. And when silver was moved to London, I got a call from one of my whales that was really irate with me. And he was mad because I had said, based on Jeff Christian's work, that there wasn't that much silver in Europe. And he'd come out of the warehouse and said, yes, there is. So I called Jeff and says, that's Buffett's silver. That's not the UK silver. I said, okay. Point making is that JP Morgan started the SLV, the largest ETF in silver with what? 130 million ounces of silver. So you guys can figure it out. And you're, someone's going to have to call me when I'm out of time because I probably spent five minutes on this one chart. But So as Chen's pointed out, and thank you, Chen, silver is so undervalued, it hurts. I mean, you look at silver versus copper, lead, zinc, tin, iron, ore, platinum, palladium, or rhodium, it's not even close to its all-time high. And yet all those metals are up at least 25 to 100%. Chart from the Silver Institute, current, fairly current. I probably picked this up a couple of years ago. Silverware is only 40%. And when Peter said it was up, I think 70 or 77, I got a mind for numbers, you know, and that's significant, but it's a big percentage on a small amount, but still it's significant. Um, physical investment has been much bigger than it's been in the last 20 years. I mean, I'm not saying specifically this one year, but if you go back, you know, two decades, there wasn't that much interest in silver as an investment. That's increased. Industrial man keeps growing. And the point here is not only is it more than half of the market, but you've got to realize that silver back 20 years ago was 35% of the market. But 20 years ago, the most silver produced was 550 million ounces per annum. And now we're producing 850 million ounces per annum with about 150 million being recycled and it's 54% of the market. So if we do a small thought experiment just for thinking purposes only and say, what if the plateau of silver mining was 550 million ounces for the last 20 years? It's not, it's increased, I'm making that point. But just imagine if it was only 550 million ounces and industrial man increased to what I'm showing Almost all the silver uh, above ground or, or mined would be used for industrial only. And we're going to get there in my studied view. So uh, velocity to mining, I'm going to skip that. Peter kind of covered that. Same chart Peter showed. I don't give a fig what anyone thinks. I like to show fact. And the fact is, if you're in the precious metals of the last 20 years, you've been a superior investor to those in the Dow Jones or the S&P. That's just a fact. Silver supply, the deficits forecast to grow. This is from BMO. I'm not going to get into it. You can debate whether or not the above ground stockpiles are growing or not. Uh, my pet peeve on that is people think this is a big deal. It really isn't because it's the float and it's the demand that really moves the market. Here's the fact that we're seeing um, Mine supply has really been flat since about 2015. And, you know, people make a big deal about a 2% increase in, in silver. And when you're talking a billion ounces, 2% is a pretty big number. But um, for all practical purposes, what I know, and, you know, I'll defer to my colleagues, I'd say Peter and Chen are both probably smarter than me at this point. I'm getting too many senior moments, but I don't see a big increase uh, going forward. So Chen showed us this. I mean, the photovoltaic market is rapidly increasing. And again, you guys can call me out on time. I don't want to, I'm a professional. I don't want to hurt anyone's time. But the idea that you, the amount of cost for a kilowatt of power using solar is equal to or better than conventional resources is fine. That's a fact. What people don't know is the idea that we'll just switch to solar is a misnomer. Why? Well, because myself and others have done a complete study on how much silver is required to power everything solar. And if you took just the residential demand in the United States 
it would take the entire silver supply in one year to just have solar powered residences. But let's back a commercial because we live in the real world and we've got shopping centers, schools, churches, warehouses, factories. So those take about 1.5 times as much silver as the residential market does. So if you add those two together, you've got over like 3 billion ounces of silver to make what? The United States solar only? Well, it is 25% of the demand market in resources. It's only 5% in population, but I'll use 25% because it's more accurate because especially on the commercial side. But there's no way with today's technology, and I'm not saying that we couldn't uh, thrift more in the solar panel industry, perhaps we can. And Chen makes a point that really, if you really are cost efficient, you're gonna use more silver per panel because you wanna get as much density, as much energy out as energy in, and I won't go into the energy return on energy invested, but there's a lot to this story that people don't know. And my colleagues have certainly brought this to the fore and me with my big voice is gonna keep pounding the table. So this is probably the most important chart and my two colleagues have made the point, but if you go here and it's not my chart, I'll give, I like to give credit where it's due. Matt Watson produced this, a good thinker. So what he's showing here is the mined and recycled silver is this red dotted line and the columns going up from 2020, which it matches and beyond. If you get to 2030, what you see is this delta, this change above the mine and recycled silver. And what that means is, where's it coming from? In theory, you're basically running out. Now, there is investor silver. And, you know, at some price that might come to the market. Would enough of it come to the market to fulfill this projection of how much silver is going to be needed throughout the industry, especially with solar demand going and really and God bless Matt, and I'm not saying I'm perfect, but I think he's underestimated the, the PV demand. Uh, if you look at this chart, Chen, we could talk about it offline. But if you really take a better look at this, it pushed these numbers up even higher. And that's still being conserved. As Chen pointed out, you get waste in any process and you get solar panels that don't perform properly, or discounted, and very few solar panels. So we've seen the gold-silver ratio go all over the place. I showed you a, the Warren Buffett chart. You know, we hit the 16 to 1 monetary ratio in 1979. And I think we'll hit it again. I really do. Sounds preposterous looking at this chart when you got over 125 in 2012. I not only pounded the table, Chen, I drove the truck around. And I loaded up <clears throat> along with a lot of my subscribers. So we're down in this range now. I think. Anything above 80 is ridiculous, but it's been there several times as the circles show. But as Peter put it out so well, there's a trend that started that very few people see. Uh, we're in a channel formation of the easiest to trade. If it breaks through the top of the channel, you go long. If it breaks through the bottom of the channel, you go short. I won't short silver, although I have hedged because I have a pretty good position, as you may imagine. But I'm just not going to short something I believe in so strongly. But we're going back and forth, and um, you know I think we're going to break to the upside. We might see another you know eighteen dollar drift down. I don't know. I've never said I know everything, or and I've always said the market knows more than any of us. Silver is undervalued to the real estate market. What people don't understand is the basics. For example, if silver was up. 4% last year, whatever the number is, Peter could correct me, I think it was something like that. And the housing market's off 35%. That means your silver buys 37% more house. You know, well, wait a minute, silver doesn't do anything. Well, relative to what? Yeah, that's the real question. Relative to the housing market, relative to the stock market, relative to the devastating bond market that's imploding. And bonds are the key to the kingdom. I won't go into it why, but financial guys. So here's what we have from the query and incrementum shows you the bull markets of uh, 1974, 1980, and the current one. I'm not saying they're totally accurate, but the idea is safe and sound, meaning that we've got a long ways to go to the upside. And I do believe that this will be the biggest market in precious metals ever in all of financial history. 
So remember, 90% of the move comes in the last 10% of the time. That's not only true in the silver market. That's what happened last time. It does not guarantee it'll happen again. But if you look at the tech wreck, you look at the housing bubble, you look at uh, the rapeseed market, which is canola oil. I mean, I follow markets pretty closely. You get a big increase that goes exponential at the end of the cycle. And the hardest part is selling into strength, which I'm good at because I've traded commodities for so long. The problem I have is do I tell my people to sell precious silver for some fiat currency? And the answer is I doubt it. So we might just do a direct purchase. You know, I'll call up Peter and say, how many of your Bentleys do you want to sell me for this many ounces of silver? <laughs> Trying to throw a little humor at you guys. So streaming even, companies even, are where it's at. I've featured those in the Morgan Report for people that are serious investors who've done well, who've done perfect. No, no one does. I look at the whole spectrum from, you know, prospectors that call me to the multi-conglomerates are really the big, you know, not only the Newmonts, but the big streamers like Wheaton and uh, Franco and those type of companies. Thanks for that uh, a great in-depth look at um not only where silver has been, but where uh, where we all think it's uh, it's heading. Um, we are going to jump to our first presenting company, which is uh, GR Silver. We have Eric uh, Zonsherb, who is com uh, company CEO. Um, Eric, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Peter, and thank you to the Metals Investment Forum for for hosting this this interesting forum. Um, thank you also to Peter and David and Chen for their 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 pearls of wisdom. I'm looking forward to getting onto YouTube and seeing the rerun so I can learn even more. So moving on to GR Silver, this is an aerial view of the area and the cautionary statements that are uh, that are customary. I expect you all to answer the exam at the end of this. So as a former analyst, I spent 34 years as an analyst. I was always looking for the five P's, stories that have project, place, people, price, and potential. And I think we tick all of those boxes, and I'll show you why. The project is called the Plumosus Project. We're looking at 430 square kilometers. Uh, just off the map here is Mazatlan. You take a 45-minute uh, toll road to El Rosario, which is a 250-year history of mining, and then a one-hour trip by dirt road into the, the two locations. We have excellent infrastructure, including grid power directly to the site. Um, we have excellent relationships with the Ejidos around there. We have existing mining licenses. These are two former producers. La Trinidad was an open pit oxide gold operation started by El Dorado Gold. And then you've got a base metal mine here, the Plumosos mine, which was operated from 86 to 2001 by Group Mexico. These dotted lines are the key geological story here. They are the structures, the deep-seated structures along which one sees fluid flow and metals deposition. Um, further here to the northwest, you can see Vizla, which most of you are going to be familiar with. Moving on to Plumosus Project, we have two areas that we're focused on, the San Marcial area and the Plumosus Mine area. They are about five kilometers apart, so very, very close with the potential for, syn for synergies there. Um, San Marcial is a resource expansion story, whereas the Plumosus Mine area is all about addressing grade, and I'll get into that. But the near-term catalyst for GR Silver, and the key thing to remember here is that there's a near-term catalyst in the next few weeks. We have promised a resource update for both areas by the end of March, and that has a potentially important catalytic impact. This is a, an aerial view of the San Marcial area, a view to the west. See up here the Plumosus mine area within this ridge and the San Marcial area here. In red is the 2019 resource area. And since that time, we have drilled 75 holes, about 10,500 meters, and expanded resource footprint. So that is what's going to be expressed in that resource update we have coming up. The key thing about San Marcial is that it is a silver dominant mineralization that we're looking at there. And we're getting excellent recovery rates of over 90% in preliminary work. Moving on to slide seven, you can see here another view of the San Marcial area, this time to the southwest. This trace, this red dotted line, is the contact between upper volcanics and lower volcano sedimentary package. This small red slash here, that is the 2019 resource. Um, we have followed mineralization along this corridor, along this, uh, this contact. 
and made a new discovery to the southeast called the Southeast Discovery Area. And we have added here, as I said, about 75 holes and uh, in 10, 10,000 meters. We did an extensive lithogeochem chem sampling program here, sampling every 25 meters that highlights that there are several silver anomaly that are yet to be tested here. And that's going to be the future of the company in 2023. You can uh, expect exploration to extend along this contact. In the meantime, you also have this structural corridor, these faults that cut through, and we're finding more and more on this project, the importance of these cross-cutting structures and how they bring later mineralization, both silver and gold, uh, into, into the picture at a later stage. Now, the first thing we did is a drill the hole in here, hole number 2210, which cut 101.6 meters of 308 grams of silver. And again, that's silver, not silver equivalents. So that's extremely desirable today. Moving on now, this is a long section through the deposit from northwest to southeast. Up here, we have the 52 holes that went into the resource from 2019. And we've definitely demonstrated the extension of high-grade silver mineralization down to depth, as well as this new southeast discovery area within this corridor. Okay, so that's extremely important. Um, I think I'd highlight too the fact that these are broad intersections. So for example, hole number 20, as I highlighted before, 186 meters in, in that hole, 111 grams, um, 113 meters at 61 grams, but within that some very high grade intersections. We're chasing broad mineralization here that is amenable potentially to large scale mining. So open pit close to surface and underground um, yeah, room and pillar, for example, as opposed to chase narrow veins. So that's extremely important. Um, we're also picking up gold mineralization, later structures, cross-cutting structures, like a meter here of 205 grams gold. And we are continuing to, uh, to follow that up. Another view of San Marcial, this time southeast, northwest. The olive is the expansion of the footprint from the red. The red is 2019. The olive is today. We're also finding new subparallel um, hydrothermal breaches as well as stockworks underneath. And so that's what we are following up. Now, if we step five kilometers to the north, we get to the Plumosis area. And the Plumosis area, as I mentioned, is a former mine. You can see in gray the outline of 7.4 kilometers of underground development that's still in excellent shape. We've been able to map and sample throughout that. In August 21, we disappointed the market with a resource, the first resource for this area, that averaged 45 grams per ton silver. It's not economic. Put us in the doghouse. Quite understandable. The reality is that, that was based to a large extent on over 500 historical drill holes from the base metal miners. And quite simply, they did a lot of selective sampling where they saw sulfides, galena, and sphalerite. They took samples. Where they didn't see them, they didn't sample. So now at Plumosis, we've drilled over 11,700 meters, 186 holes, new holes since that resource. And we are going to be putting out a resource update, something to look forward to over the next few weeks that has effectively eliminated 149 holes that had selective sampling that did not contribute to the resource block model. And you can see that block model here. These green areas are extremely low grade, 30 to 100 grams per ton. But you can also see that in places we hit things like 12 and a half meters of 1.1 kilos of silver equivalent. This is a polymetallic deposit. And so we have contributed um, greatly to the grade that's going to move it from 45 grams per ton towards, I'm not promising, but towards the average mined grade here of 190 grams per ton silver. In addition, we have now discovered cross-cutting structures that are contributing greatly to precious metals mineralization. For example, a stockwork intersection here on the side, 44 and a half meters of half a kilo of silver equivalent. So again, we're looking at, at large stopes. This is an historic stope from the 775 level, and you can see it's over 25 meters tall. This is what we're talking about here. We're not talking about narrow vein mining, we're talking about bulk underground mining, Woman pillar as we see here. Moving on, you can see the impact of successively higher uh, accelerated drilling. We own our five rigs of our own, and we're very, very cost effective with those rigs. 
not to mention the important impact on community relations by employing so many people. Approximately 90% of our, of our people are from the local area. So cumulatively more drilling, and that results in cumulatively more resources from historical to uh, pre-2019 to 2019, 2021. And now you're going to see a new resource here over the next few weeks, a very important catalyst, in my opinion. Our priorities, ESG, just like everyone else, not going to get into greenwashing here, but we do a lot of work with local people, with school programs, all kinds of positive things. We have a strong emphasis on safety and health. Um, right through COVID, we were able to work our way through uh, COVID because of the strict protocols that we had on site. Capital structure, currently uh, now we are 30 million on top of this at 261 million shares. We just closed earlier this week on a non-brokered private placement, raising $3 million from existing and new shareholders. Very proud of that. And that gives us the flexibility uh, to time the next raise that will fund 2023. We have street coverage. We think that's going to be expanding after the resource update. 29% uh, institutional shareholding. First Majestic still has a 9% interest from a property that they've ended into the company and management and insiders have skin in the game. In terms of valuation, we're currently trading at 75 cents US for M plus I ounce in the ground. Can you tell I used to be an analyst? But yeah, so at 75 cents, we deserve to be there given the low grade that we published in August 21. But the reality is that we're going to be increasing the number of ounces in the next few weeks. We're gonna be increasing the average grade of those ounces. And I believe that that will translate into an increase in the valuation on an average basis as we move from something that's clearly not economic to something towards which it is. The average in this group is 275. So there's a significant re-rating potential here as we move forward. Um, I'm not going to dwell on the details, but we've got a great team. Marcio Fonseca, kudos to Marcio for having uh, generated this idea, put together the property package, and, and moving this forward, doing a great job mentoring the, the Mexican team there and seeing that the job is done the right way. On the board, we have Laura Diaz, who is the uh, Mexico City-based lawyer and the former director general of Mines for Mexico, so she knows how this works. Recent addition is Larry Taddy, who for 12 years was the CFO at Mag Silver and was an essential part of that silver story being advanced in Mexico. So I think with this, this is a story that has all the right components. We're talking about scalability, excellent exploration potential, people that know what they're doing, and a near-term catalyst to focus on over the next few weeks. I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Well, thanks for that, Eric. Great overview of GR Silver. And so why don't we jump to the uh, Q&A now? Um, I, will, uh, I will open it to, uh, to Chen and to David uh, to start with questions, if you have uh, questions for, um, for Eric. Hi, Eric. A great presentation. Oh, thank you, uh, sir. Question, this is a historical mine. Uh, do you have a mining license or that uh, you need to reapply for that? What, what's the status? Yeah, the property is made up of three pieces. It's, it's the amalgamation of three different properties that were uh, very well acquired by, by Marcio in the creation of the company. And so we have existing mining licenses at Plomosus and at La Trinidad. The, the uh, license at San Marcial is an exploration license. But yes, we could, with very little tweaking, move those two mining licenses into production. I don't really have a great question. I mean, I think I'll just revivify what Eric said. You know, it's looking at a re rating, uh, the reason why it had such a low grade. And I think everything you outlined, and I mean, I'm pretty clear on the story now. It's actually something I didn't look at. Um, closely for a while uh i did before this presentation I was pretty impressed i think it's Mar marcina marcio i forget his exact name i mean i've known him for a very long time couldn't uh, give a more uh pat on the back as an expression because um this business is all about the people you have and i know how good he is so i just have a comment for you eric I was please sir yeah, I appreciate that. And I, I would 
you know, double down on that. Marcio has been fantastic. Marcio uh, comes via Valet, where he did resource estimation. He was a banker at Macquarie, then uh, VP corporate development at uh, at uh, Silvercrest, and then he built this property portfolio up. and And it's a, it's really been a pleasure to work with Marcio on this project. Thanks for that, David. And um, so I've uh, you did obviously touch on this, Eric, but um, I was wondering. If you could maybe elaborate a little bit to the extent that you can about the the grades at San Marcial Southeast and how is the potential for this to affect uh, the upcoming uh, resource update. Yeah, absolutely. And and as I've emphasized, we're looking at larger thicknesses here. This is extensive mineralization, both in terms of hydrothermal breccia as well as stockworks and veins outside of that. And over these larger widths, you're getting grades that, um, as you can see, well over 100 grams per ton. And uh, within that, some extremely high grade sections. So uh, this is this is something very different from, say, Juan Escipio or um, Las Chispas or Napoleon and and uh, and. and Bonaparte up at Tavisla. So I, I think the street is currently looking for an average grade of well over 100 grams per ton. Um, we're not providing any guidance, but I do suggest that, that, that that's what the street is looking for at this time. Okay. Uh, we have a question from a, uh, a viewer, which is, um, are there any refiners located nearby? Well, Mexico is the top mining nation globally, and so there are all kinds of, of smelters around that will take concentrate. Um, as I mentioned, the Plumosas mine was in production by Grupo Mexico from, from 86 to 2001. So the concentrate from Plumosas is extremely well known. It's a known fact, a uh, known entity, if you will. So we're not too concerned about that. We've also had approaches from various companies that are keeping an eye on us uh, to see when we'll be able to provide them with, with concentrate. Great. Um, I actually wanted to ask you as well, in terms of, um, you talked about how these are not narrow veins, these are wider stopes underground, and the potential for bulk mining, and if you can elaborate on that, and then take that a step further, and if, you know, if you get to the point where you're mining it, and you're, you're acquiring equipment for it, um, if you just to look at the for a moment at the sort of the environmental side of it, the potential or the or the the uh, justifiability of going towards perhaps uh, electric electric powered equipment that that sort of thing is that something that you can you can speak to? Yeah, I mean we're we're definitely seeing a a, a new trend in underground mining. Uh, and certainly there are now electric vehicles that are that are being used underground, we, we sort of on two ends of the spectrum, if you will. Underground, we're seeing a lot more electric um, uh, mining equipment. And so the potential is there. As I mentioned, we have grid power directly to site. So that's that's a, a natural step to consider. Uh, on the other end of the spectrum, you've got massive open pits like in Australia that are using electric. So and what's lacking is in between. We're in that small underground stage where there's it's definitely beneficial to use electric mining equipment from an environmental perspective. Uh, as I said, we have grid access. So I'm, I'm pleased to say that is an option. But let's let's face it, we are still in the exploration phase. We'll be working towards technical studies, whether it's later this year or later. And so we're, we're a few years away from, from making decisions as to what kind of equipment that will be used underground. But suffice to say, that's an attractive option. Sure. Um, one, I guess one last question. Uh, I'm actually wondering uh, when you, and again, this I realize this is probably quite early, but the potential for some, at least some portion of this deposit to be mined as an open pit and versus underground or perhaps starting as a pit and then transitioning. Yeah, that's an extremely important question question today and as most most people are aware the current government the federal government in mexico is is not positively disposed towards open pit mining but i'd have to qualify that that would be in greenfields locations that we are seeing progress with with projects that are in a brownfield location and particularly for for those projects that you would use potentially use an open pit as a starter to a, a more extensive life as an underground mine. So by no means would you exclude the potential for open pit mining. And clearly what we have at Plomosis is conducive to underground mining, especially when you already have 
almost eight kilometers of underground development in a great condition already. It's a matter of developing stopes off that under off that off that development. Whereas San Marcial, you can see, has the potential to have a large component that is open pit. Excellent. Well, thanks very much for that, Eric. I think we will uh, wrap it up as far as GR Silver is concerned concern for this moment. And Thank we you will very now much. move on. Thanks. Thanks again, Eric. And we'll move on to the next company, Kootenai Silver. We have James McDonald, who is president and CEO. James, the, the floor is yours to, uh, to tell us about uh, Kootenai. Great. Thanks, Peter. And thanks to the other members of the panel here. Really interesting presentation so far. And uh, like Eric, also looking forward to going back to and seeing the replay and catching some of what I didn't, didn't catch first time around. So um, Kootenai Silver is, uh, we're focused on exploration development in Mexico uh, because we're interested in silver and Mexico is the biggest silver producing region in the world. And um, so we've made a number of very successful discoveries here in the, in the past. We've been in Mexico a long time. And we're in the last uh, three years plus here, we've been in this in this discovery of a very significant looking new vein system in Mexico, high classic high grade silver veins. So that's what our focus is going to be here in the talk today. And uh, of course, uh, the forward looking statements, uh, be aware of that, we'll make plenty of those, I'm sure. And so with Kootenai Silver, what you're looking at investing in the company are two aspects really first it first and foremost is this brand new high grade discovery called columba and uh, secondly we also have a very large uh, silver asset base with our existing uh, resources from prior discoveries that we've made one of the largest junior owned uh, asset silver asset bases in mexico so this gives us a real leverage to silver price alone and then the Columba discovery, our, our classic exploration model, and the Columba discovery is giving us this great explosive growth potential through uh, new discovery great, uh, and uh, drill intercepts, uh, setting us up for a potential for real re-rating, particularly if we start, not say if, but when we start to see these higher silver prices that the panel is predicting here, and that which we also believe in as well. Uh, on on that note, we you know we believe this next silver rally may be the one that's going to see us through the old highs. Uh, capital structure you can see here: 415 million shares issued. Uh, our daily volume is pretty good, nearly a million shares a day on the average of the last three months. Uh, that cash position position you see there was at the end of September, and uh, since then we've done a financing that's gone. Uh, a lot of that's gone to uh, helping finish the remaining payments to get 100% of this new high grade discovery. And then we've got some pretty key shareholders here. You can see Eric Sprott, Condire, a fund from Texas, management directors, and then institutions. Uh, former investments in the past uh, from major mining companies are a testament to the different discoveries we've made, Core, Agnico, and Pan American. So, uh, Let's get into talking about the Columba uh, high-grade silver discovery, uh, which is also backed by our resource base in two different deposits, where we have 136 million ounces of silver equivalent in the m and i and another 35 million ounces in inferred. That's in the Promontorial and Negra property and the La Ciguera properties. So this gives us uh, pure lever uh, leverage to the silver price as well. And then we've also got a successful generative uh, program giving us this pipeline of projects, uh, early stage things that we typically option out. And uh, the, recently we sold one of those projects to our partner, Aztec Minerals, for 10 million shares and a half percent royalty. It's a very interesting uh, gold oxide system and part of a gold copper porphyry. Uh, it's got great potential. So our assets are located all in Mexico, of course. You see in this um, map here, uh, the high-grade Colombo project in the upper part here in Chihuahua State. 
La Ciguera, one of our resource projects in the famous Perel District, and then Promontorio, our original discovery in Sonora State. Uh, recent milestones really center around lots of drilling on Columba and, lot, and financings and lots of high-grade results coming out of that. And, uh, and then a catalyst going forward here is going to be initiating a staged 50,000 meter drill program and where we envision that culminating in may, uh, maiden resource. And then uh, we're also looking at uh, resource updates on uh, Promontorio to include a discovery called the Negra that's never had a resource done on it yet. So uh, Columba, it's a classic vein system. Uh, and you can see here, we've, there's uh, been a lot of high grade intercepts that we've made uh, over over uh, our drill campaigns here. Two periods of historic drilling, 1900 and around 1960, or uh, historic mining, sorry. In the early 1900s, they put a shaft down, in fact, 200 meters with six levels out. So they were getting ready for some pretty significant mining that was halted by the revolution. And it was records from this old mine that got us interested here. It indicated some really high grades, which we've confirmed in multiple vein now veins now, uh, 17 meters of 650 silver, for example, six meters over 2000 grams per ton. And uh, I need to be moving along fairly fast. This is in a uh, caldera setting. So this picture shows this, this actual volcanic vent here. And these are our vein sets that's sitting within it. And what's interesting is at the bottom of this caldera, you've just exposed the top of your veins. And when you go up the sides of that caldera, you lose your veins and in entirely in some cases you only have a breccia with no silver five grams maybe but you drill down 150 meters or so and we're getting intercepts like uh 17 meters of 650 grams per ton where at surface we barely see anything so whatever's been deposited here originally is still preserved and we're seeing scale here as well so here's our um vein swarm here the shaded areas are the concessions that we don't own. We've got 10,000 hectares around this entire package. And so this footprint here now is four kilometers by three kilometers. And you can see that compared to some famous uh, vein systems. Um, Las Chispas of Silvercrest here on the left. It's going in now in production. Then the Vizsla, of course, in the middle, now over 200 million ounces. So we've got certainly got the scope here for something of very significant size. And then in some of the detail of what these veins look like, the historic vein is here in the middle. And we've got about 40 holes into that so far. You can see we've gotten some great results, 800 grams per ton uh, there over two meters. But every vein set here that we've tested has high grades. The D vein looks particularly interesting nearly 30 meters of over 400 grams with almost 18 to 650, 90 meters underneath that, we've got 34 meters, a half a kilo. So real exciting, real big upside. And the opposite side of the property, we're getting six meters at 2000 grams per ton, just lots of scope here. The uh, Now going forward, I'll have to skip through these long sections here uh, in the interest of time. Uh, but going forward, what we're looking at doing are stepping off all these high-grade intercepts we've had in the D, J, J, Z, extending the, uh, following those, uh, finding the limits, and then drilling all those veins that haven't even been drilled yet. So this is going to be a stage program. Uh, the initial stage will be 10,000 meters of drilling, uh, followed by another 15,000. And uh, we've already got 27,000 meters drilled in 135 holes. And then stage three will be the it will be following up on those results. And uh, some and, and this will be culminating in a maiden resource for us. And so moving along here, I'll just touch very briefly on our resource projects. La Ciguera and the Perel districts. One thing I want to point out here. This is open pit constrained, uh, 51 and a half million ounces in the M and I category, 11 and a half in the inferred. That's in two kilometers of a structure that's at least 10 kilometers long up here. 
And this is on the extension of the Santa Barbara, San Francisco, Delora part of the district where half a billion ounces of silver have been produced. So this is one of those areas geologically where once you're in production, you keep replacing reserves for decades. And there's all kinds of great upside on this project. Uh, we've uh, finished a detailed geologic model because we think we can tighten up the controls here on the silver and that, that this uh, resource might have a better grade, in fact. Then Promontory, our original discovery is a huge low grade a diatrine uh, system, uh, silver, gold, lead, zinc. And we made a second discovery uh, in uh, 2015 called the Negra, this little pipe that sticks out of the ground here. So it's a minimal open pit, had some incredible discovery holes, like 50 meters of 420 grams per ton right from surface, 200 meters of 156. Pan American was going to take this to production if it got to uh, 50 million ounces. Didn't get that big, so we got it back 100%. And, um, and so this has not yet had a resource uh, calculated on it even. There was my alarm to warn me that we're out of time. Uh, so I just want to finish up here by saying our board and management's really well-rounded, especially for a junior. We've got experience right from grassroots exploration to mine building and mine operations. Uh, my background is I was a geologist, been involved in running underground silver mine in Mexico and also was a founder of National Gold, which eventually became Alamos Gold. Uh, we bought the Mulatto's deposit 20 years ago from Placer Dome and Kennecott, and that turned into Alamos Gold. I stepped up that board uh, about 10 years ago. And then, uh, so just to wrap it up here and turn it to questions. Uh, with uh, Kootenai Silver investing in one of the largest junior-owned silver asset bases in Mexico, and you're participating in this really exciting new high-grade discovery at Columba, which we see really great upside potential on in terms of high-grade ounces in a what looks to be a brand new uh, vein district that we've uh, discovered here. So with that, uh, Peter, I think we can turn it over to some uh, Q&A. Okay, well, thank you so much, James. Uh, appreciate that great overview of Kootenai Silver. Um, I will open the floor to, to Chen, to David. Uh, let you guys start and uh, jump in if you have questions for James. I'll go ahead and start. This came through the portal. James, uh, what are your thoughts on the Mexican government's take on underground versus open pit? Well, uh, th this uh, <laughs> interesting question. Uh, we're looking at um, the, this Columba discovery being underground. I don't see that being open pit, so it's not an issue with regards to that. Um, I don't know where that stance is going to go. Uh, mining is such a big industry in Mexico, and uh, the biggest mine operation will be Cananea, which is a historic mine, is one of the biggest copper producers in the world even today. So it, it's something that I think will evolve into more open pit mines being developed eventually. Um, but let's see what happens. And a follow-up, and we've asked, I give you this question almost every time. <laughs> Uh, I was actually looking at one of my old videos last time, my cousin with me and talking about the energy crunch coming toward us and maybe just the idea that some nation states says, you know what, we need our silver to make more solar because we're running out of oil or whatever. So the question I get most often, I've asked you before, James, is what do you think about the jurisdictional issues potentially around Mexico versus other jurisdictions? I know the answer, but I always get that question. So please take it away. Yeah, so I consider that Mexico to still be one of the very best jurisdictions in the world to be operating for mining. As I touched on, it's got a very long mining history. Uh, mining is a pretty big part of its, uh, of its economy. And does uh, and some of the biggest mining companies in the world are, are Mexican. So you've got quite a mining culture there. You've got great infrastructure because of that. You've got great infrastructure in terms of knowledge, maps, surveys, 
uh, and then human infrastructure in all aspects of of exploration and mining in terms of geologists, engineers, metallurgists, miners, and so on and so forth. So, and and you have a, a clear laws and a clear path to uh, be able to permit and acquire mine permits uh, in Mexico on a timeline that is still much better than what you see in the rest of North America. So I consider uh, Mexico to be uh, quite still quite a favorable jurisdiction. Thank you. I'm done. Okay, great. Thank you. Great presentation, James. And uh, well, just actually another question just popped up. I was just uh, tweeting uh, with my friend that uh, Mexican government nationalized the leasing project. So uh, you know, do you have any comments on that? Yeah, so in, interesting take in the, in the last uh, 20 years of my time in Mexico, a couple of that's the second thing like that that's happened. The first thing is when they um, applied for and acquired a huge areas of concessions for to cover methane gas, uh, because methane gas was a thing 10 or 15 years ago for a while. And they they didn't want the mining law to be used as a loophole into the petroleum industry. And so they actually acquired mining concessions, the government did to, to cover that loophole. So the lithium is tied into that in that all of the um, petroleum uh, or oil gas in Mexico is state owned and uh, run by Pemex. And that's the way it's been for uh, as long as I can remember and I'm aware of. And so this lithium is kind of got hooked into that as being energy, so, um, another source of energy or form of call it energy in an indirect odd way. So uh, I don't really know, you know, understand the full end of the logic, but that's how it got it tied in there. And so I think it's just one of these odd things like the methane was quite an odd thing to happen. Yeah, and, yeah. And because it's related to energy, the energy in oil and gas. Yeah, I remember they have a monopolized in natural gas and they have a lot of issues and eventually they have forced to privatize that. So let me ask you another question of mine. And what's your exit strategy? Can you tell uh, investors, will you plan to build a mine or you want to build up your resource, which is really impressive resource and then maybe sell to a bigger company? We, yeah, I mean, we certainly ha have the experience for going all the way to production. Uh, and we've done that with other companies in the past. Uh, with Kootenai Silver, our objective is to sell the project and then spin out the, ass the remaining assets and continue with our core group in Mexico. We've, we've got a, a core group of people in Mexico uh, who are really good or very skilled at what they do and really the key to our success, uh, quite frankly. And so we that's the strategy is to, let's build the assets up to where we get a buyer and then spin this out and continue on. Because the other thing, in addition to our people there is we've got an incredible database built up over, over the time we've been uh, exploring in Mexico. It'll probably rival any database that anyone has. Great, thank you. Well, thanks, Chen, for those uh, those great questions, and thanks, James, for your responses. And again, this uh, great overview of Kootenai. We have some uh, amazing insights into uh, what your work and and the progress. Uh, and we will now move on to our last presenter. So that's Outcrop Silver and Gold. We have uh, Joseph Hebert, who is president and CEO. Joseph, the uh, floor is yours. Thank you, Peter, and, and thanks to uh, MIF. And I have to give a special thanks to, to uh, Chen because Chen was actually on the project last week. And more than that, he was a popular, uh, popular in the audience that we had with the Vice Minister of Mines. Um, uh, Giovanni Franco was very, very. He was very impressed. Franco was very impressed with uh, Chen's knowledge and 
and grasp of silver and, and silver voltaic, voltaics. Um, I want to talk about Santa Ana project um, in Colombia. It's a rich, it was one of the richest uh, mines of Spanish colonial air, sometimes uh, reporting up to 30 kilograms. How crap has a high grade silver gold discovery. Uh, we have a pending made in compliant resource for this for the end of March or the quarter, 20, quarter, first quarter of 2023. Then we think there's a future mine uh, in Santa Ana. Uh, Forward-looking statements, of course, uh, basically uh, the as different aspects of risk, risk affecting outcome. Um, Santa Ana is facing a very important milestone. We're moving the high-grade silver discovery to the next stage of value with the 43101 resource. We'll have a resource statement in the first quarter of 2023. We expect the grade to be in the upper 20th percentile actually worldwide or, or only to have a you know, less than half a dozen projects with higher grade than what we have. We do have uh, uh, some internal guidance of between 45 and 55 million silver equivalent ounces of between 550 and 750 grams equivalent silver per ton. Uh, 195 million shares outstanding, fully diluted 302. Um, that reflects a, a commitment to uh, put money on the ground and, and create something of significant value for shareholders. Uh, management and directors has 12% of the company. Uh, Eric Sprott still maintains 14%, and we have the rest in high net worth investors and retail. We do have one analyst coverage, which is um, uh, research capital, Stuart McDougall. He has us as a speculative buy at 75 cents if we um, are able to put together 50 million ounces, uh, at, at, um, and that value would be at uh, $3 an ounce. Um, being as at $3 an ounce is, is rather an average. I think there's a lot of upside with respect to that 75 cents. It could be significantly more um, uh, just based on the, on the grade and, and, and the, dollar, the uh, enterprise value dollar per ounce would be attributed to that grade. Um, just an overview, it's highway access, it's including a major transmission line, it's hydroelectric power, which tends to be uh, uh, more cheaply priced in Colombia. It uh, uh, has water on the project, strong community support, and excellent security conditions. It's, it's just like working in, in, in safer parts of Mexico and uh, really with no particular security requirements. Importantly um, for Colombia, silver is a strategic metal for the, new, for the government's new energy transition economy. Um, so we um, are talking to the vice Minister of Mines, Giovanna Franco, about the possibility of being on, on a, what they call their uh, PNA uh, list of projects, which is a project of strategic national importance, which puts you in the fast lane for um, uh, exploration and development. We have uh, over 50,000 meters of drilling, over now I think 330 holes. The weighted average grade of all the intercepts above 200. Uh, grams equivalent silver per ton, which, which we expect to be the cutoff grade for our resources, 1,000 is, um, is 1 1.4 kilograms uh, silver per ton. It's um, really a silver gold project, there is some lead zinc, but the equivalency that up to 1.4 kilograms is about seven and a half grams gold and about 860 grams silver. Uh, World-class potential, uh, near-term exploration uh, is 18 kilometers. Um, of, of veins, those are actually vein zones that consist of vein packages. In the district, there's over 60 kilometers of vein zones. Again, packages of three or four veins, so that probably represents 100, 180 individual, 180 kilometers of individual veins. And um, really, it, it's comparable to some of the famous districts in terms of the vein put, footprints as Fresno and Guanajuato. We uh, will have our maiden resource in the first quarter, and uh, based on uh, 10 active projects that have that, that express one to two kilograms silver at surface. We expect to have an update of the uh, resource report in, in the following 12 to 14 months. Um, this is the 18, the Southeast uh, vein zone is what we're exploring, uh, focused on now. 
It's, so the 18 kilometers is focused on one end by the Santa Ana Mine Group, the Royal Mines that produce the, you know, the tremendous uh, uh, high silver grades, and on the south end by the Frias Mine. The Frias Mine uh, produced up to 1910, I believe, uh, 7.8 million ounces at 1.3 kilograms silver recovered. Uh, so that uh, whole trend that we're working is anchored uh, by significant uh, uh, resource type resource type currencies uh, on either end and then we have 10 to 12 targets uh, between the two that that all express over a kilogram of silver per ton uh, there's just on the right is some of the headliner assays um, january uh, we had 3.5 meters and bones 4.9 kilograms uh, in uh, last november we had 2.7 uh, meters of 6.615 grams uh, October 2.4 meters of almost two kilograms, and August 8.9 meters of 1.6 kilograms. Um, it's it's a good straightforward exploration. Uh, it's a common commonly the uh, veins outcrop and the mineralization outcrops. We have some. We've developed two new very important exploration vectors. Is when we set up a drill rig, we put our first hole at about 700 meters mean sea level which is usually about 150 meters or so below the surface, because that will almost invariably be the top of ore or near the top of ore district wide. Also the ore chutes, uh, because of the, the structural um, uh, makeup of the project, the ore chutes have a systematic occurrence of every 300 to 400 meters along veins. So it's just you know one after the other through that 18 kilometers. Um, the, Average true width is between uh, 0 0.77 to 1.6, depending on what shoot you're in. Uh, it's in, uh, it's worth recognizing, and it's actually, uh, it's worth recognizing that Brutica now, uh, you know, which is a world-class system, their vein width is now down to 0.7 meters true width, and they are doing one meter uh, long haul open stoping. Um, we're actually been able to use that as a as a reference for our independent QP uh, to to look at some of the mining methods and costs. Um, only um, the the resource veins are reflected in red on this map. The rest of the veins are perspective veins. Basically, the more work you do, the the more pack the, the more you see the veins are packaged package like. Uh, any one of these veins to the southwest are not going to be a single vein. There'll be one to three veins uh, over anywhere from uh, half a, uh, 400 meters to 600 meters width. Um, so basically, the resource veins are uh, less than 30% of the advanced target veins or perspective veins. Uh, we expect that just the targets might uh, provide a three times increase in the, in the original maiden resource uh, when we get those drilled out. We have 6,000 of 27,000 hectares uh, are titles and fully permitted. And what we do is uh, we, we intend to do kind of a rolling permit uh, where we're showing up to do the social license work way ahead of, of any drill rig. Um, another distinct advantage, it's a narrow vein system, but almost invariably, again, on a, on a large scale, the veins are in packages on a small scale scale the veins are in packages. In the Roberto Tavar, which is one of our more robust northern shoots, um, we can composite veins and wall rock together and get up to uh, eight meters true thickness at 450 grams equivalent silver per ton. Um, so it won't all be uh, very, you know, real narrow veins. It'll be some, some reasonably uh, uh, true widths that we'll also see. It, it, we've done the compositing just kind of on a volume basis, not on an engineering basis, but if we can composite 20% of the veins, our average thickness uh, almost doubles from 0.76 to 1.52. Um, another big good check mark for um, Santa Ana is very simple mineralogy and metallurgy. 90% uh, of the gold occurs in a free native state, meaning it's just, you know, like panable or, or gravity. Uh, accessible. Uh, we have 4% electrum, coarse electrum, 4 initial 4% native silver, and then 88% of the rest of the silver is in argentite itself, which is a 87% uh, chemical composition of silver. So really, we only have to crack, focus and crack one uh, mineral 
to recover the silver. And we anticipate a very uh, a simple and uh, economic uh, processing stream. Um, 80 to 90% of the silver uh, sulfides can be liberated at between 53 and 106 uh, micron. Microns grinding. Uh, average recoveries are 96% for gold. Average recoveries are 94% for silver. And we can, uh, when the concentrate uh, tests we've done, we can get about six point six and a half kilograms silver and about uh, uh, almost three ounces of gold. Um, so there was some concern about Colombia uh, uh, with the election of the Petro government. Um, it's, he's a left green, uh, more left green candidate than Colombia had seen before, but they've consistently said um, that uh, mining is needed to produce the metals for the energy transition. Uh, Colombia wants to be a part of that. Uh, they, if they can, they want to do more than export. They want to be able to pr produce um, some components of of a, a pole of a solar or or uh, that sort of thing. And basically, the government is not anti-government. They just anti-mining government. They just want to promote social and environmental minimum responsible mining, which of course everyone does. But also importantly, is they realize that uh, forty percent of um, Colombia is below the poverty line in the country, and they realize that the exploration and mining pushes wealth out into the countryside through jobs, taxes, and royalties, and uh, we, we think we're really aligned with what the government wants. So the catalyst will be, um, going forward, will be good news flow uh, for the next 12 months. Uh, we'll be drilling uh, nine near-term high-grade vein targets, uh, I mean, you know, multi-kilogram type targets commonly. Um, we'll have two to three drill rigs. We expect 1,800 meters per month. Uh, we will drill uh, the freest mine satellites, uh, which means we'll be drilling immediately adjacent to a, to a 8 million uh, ounces of silver mine. It was at 1.3 kilograms. Uh, we'll publish our upward scalable compliant resource in, in Q1 2023, and then we hope to do a revised uh, update, updated uh, in, uh, upward revised. Um, uh, report uh, within 12 to 14 months following. We do have two other high grade uh, rain projects. That's where we want, that's the space we want to be in. We want to be in extremely high grades because you can do that in Colombia. They're still available. You can walk over them. Uh, basically, it's an exercise in, in uh, um, uh, drilling a deposit that's already out of you know, the ground. We have two of those that, that um, we would like to see some drilling, but it may. It may be downstream from uh, the resource and the updated resource. We do have two projects uh, that we would like to either vend or joint venture. Uh, one of them is uh, immediately adjacent to um, the Anza uh, Agnico Newmont joint venture um, and the other, and also it's on a kind of a step over between um, uh, that has Cabredona uh, you know, 1% copper that can be mined underground, and then Urabasia on the, on the other on the next part of the step over to the west. And then we have Antares, which is basically the same thing as what uh, Grimalote looks like. And so any questions, uh, just get hold of me too at the, the, I mean, not in this forum, get hold of me any, anytime in the, uh, on the, on the web page. Well, uh, Joseph, thank you very much for that uh, great overview of outcrop. We uh, can jump now to the Q&A portion. Um, I'm going to let uh, Chen and David jump in with any questions. Chen, I know you know the story pretty well. <laughs> I was just there. Uh, very impressive. You see the native silver in, in the drill core. That's really impressive. I have a question from the web. They see, uh, do you see a better interception when you go deeper, Joe? Um, what we're seeing is a general increase in thickness um, at, at, at um, uh, below about 300 meters from surface. And then in the central part and in, in the next part we're moving towards, um, I, I believe you may have seen that it's what I can, I go here, here. Aguaguila, Guadalcanal. Uh, those veins are up to 4.7 meters at surface. Uh, and that looks like that was another colonial mine area. Uh, so, uh, and then with the compositing, 
compositing of veins together, I think we'll see a, a better uh, true thickness overall than what was expected. Wow, excellent. Yeah, I've been there and a very impressive project you have. I also have a chance to meet the vice minister. He mentioned he will work on, he will visit the project and he's working on to make it one of the national strategic importance for Colombia. Do you, can you tell us what, what time frame we will be expecting if that will be a major news uh, uh, from yeah, the company? It, yeah, it would really be tremendous uh, uh, to streamline um, permitting any sort of work uh, because you have a, you know, kind of an explicit support of the government. Uh, those are called uh, projects of uh, st national strategic importance. Um, we met, well, you know, we met with you, with the uh, Vice Minister of Mines, Giovanni Franco, uh, just last week. He explicitly said that he would be having a meeting uh, this, I believe this week or next, with the uh, included, that included Petro, and the subject would come up, actually direct for recommending that um, um, uh, Santa Ana become a a, a project of national strategic importance. There wasn't any guarantees, of course, in the conversation. But then also uh, two weeks from now, he's actually going to visit the property because he's very impressed with some of the um, uh, social work we've been doing to, in the community. And um, also he says, he, he sort of, he said that uh, it must be good because I don't hear anything bad about Santa Ana. So. Yeah, I remember he used that word. So excellent. <laughs> Thanks, Tim. David, do you have any questions for, for Joseph? Uh, if you don't mind, uh, Peter, I'm going to take a couple that came on the board from uh, Absolutely. the audience. Of One is, is there any uh, risk of the resources being nationalized? Yes, always. There's a risk in walking across the street. As James outlined, I mean, with NAFTA and all the contracts in place, even if there was a lot of pressure, and i got a book behind me so, called Resource Wars, I think it'd be negotiated. Um, I don't see it, but if you're really worried about it, you want to spread out, you want to just use common sense and uh, have some, you know, what I call conglomerates, have some streaming companies that have several jurisdictions. So if something went bad in one jurisdiction, you're not losing your whole investment. Um, one above that is, and one of you guys could back me up, what is the selling price in the ground that would be an attractive takeover? That is a tough question. So I could tell you at the top of the markets, when things are in a feeding frenzy, that you can achieve in the past uh, 10 cents on the dollar. So in other words, if gold is at $1,800 an ounce, you might be able to sell it for 180 in the ground. That's the top of the market. So what would be attractive? Well, it'd be something under that. But you could buy you know, a great situation and have a 20 year bear market, what good does it do you? So that's a tough one to answer, but Chen's uh, might be a better answer than me. And Joseph, uh, just, we talked offline. I'm, I'm envious, man, where you're, where you're at right now. I love Columbia. I love what you're doing. Uh, Chen, thanks for the input. And um, I'll just stop there. Thank you. Great. Thanks, David. And thanks, Joseph, as well. Um, did you did you want to uh, uh, comment, Joseph, on on anything David had said? Um, you know, our probable exit strategy. Uh, you know, we're we're not in any hurry. We 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 think we think we could be re-rated, which will reduce our cost of capital and let us drill more and faster. Um, uh, I think uh, we see uh, on the on the fully permitted titles, we see 150 million. Uh, ounces of silver equivalent is possible, and um, I can't I can't say what that would be valued at exactly, except for the fact that if an average is three dollars uh, used by research capital, uh, and I think I saw that in another um, I, I, saw, I think I saw that in another presentation from one of one of your silver what silver guys, um, it, you know it it could be four dollars an ounce. Yeah, I mean especially especially if silver rockets. Exactly. Exactly. Great. Um, again, in the interest of time, we're gonna we're gonna jump to uh, some questions for another company. Um, why don't we go to GR Silver and um, uh, let's see what do we have here for GR? Um, one I had. Let's see. Um, 
Actually, this is, I'm going to say a bit more of a general question, but um, Eric, maybe you can just give us your comments. The general market doesn't seem to buy into the demand supply crunch that's happening in the equity valuations for senior and intermediate silver companies outside of volatility, um, which have remained basically flat over the past year, while the actual price of silver has dropped over the year. Why, why do you think that's the case? Well, unfortunately, the equity valuations don't don't always mirror what we see in metal prices and, and you know, pick something as obscure as lithium. We've seen lithium pricing up dramatically and lithium equities languishing. In silver, we're seeing, uh, you know, two years ago, if you go back, silver was trading at $29 and we've come down to about 22. Um, so would that be about uh, about 20 odd 25 percent whereas the equity valuations if you look at enterprise value per ton per global ounce in the ground has gone down dramatically almost 100 percent from 275 to a dollar 15 today so there's a lot that the equities are not pricing in at this point in time as i believe it was chen that said that we're when this takes off, it's going to be explosive. Um, I'm I'm not someone that's going to pound the table on the commodity. I'm going to pound the table on my company and say that there are catalysts that we are going to deliver. Um, the metal, we'll see what the metal does, and we'll see what the equities do around that in general. Thanks, Eric. And I mean, you know, I think... It's interesting and important probably to note, I don't think uh, David or, or Chen would disagree, but silver is one of those markets that uh, will do nothing for the longest time. And when it starts to wake up, it just explodes higher. And so I certainly, you know, tell people or, or, or give my opinion that if, if you don't feel you have the patience for that kind of market, then maybe it's not for you <laughs> because that, that's really what you should be expecting from silver. It, it, it's not to say that it will necessarily act that way, uh, but that, that historically is, it is how it has tended to act. And so for that reason, uh, you know, people should simply not be surprised if, uh, if they're participating in it. And, and sentiment is a big thing, uh, you know, if you look at silver prices today, again, average silver prices the last three years versus average silver prices the three years prior, we're at probably somewhere around 35-40%, um, but you wouldn't know it looking <laughs> Looking at sentiment, people just you know have a have a memory of the last maybe month or few months um, typically in this kind of market, and that's kind of that's what they carry with them uh, instead of looking more realistically of where things have been over uh, I think a fair period of time and to give you better perspective. And again, um, you know you have to you have to see what um, is driving this market and where it's likely to go. And and um, and act accordingly. You know, uh, place your chips accordingly. Basically. Um, so so thanks for that. I will jump to a question for for James uh, McDonald of uh, Kootenai. We have a couple of questions here. Um, or actually, I'll let to Chen and or David jump in if either of you has a question. None yet. None for now. No, okay. not, not, yet, not, not yet. Jim, just curiosity, what, what type of license, the mining license you have, is it underground and open pit or both? Well, it's expiration. So we, we've got the permits for, for, the, for the drilling. Okay. And so we're, we're just at that, that stage. Okay. So you, what kind of uh, going forward, you more lean towards uh, underground? Yeah. In the case of Columba, yeah, that, that's underground vein style. So we're we're seeing veins there that are running true width from roughly one meter to sort of five meter with stock works around them that can be up to maybe 15, 20 meters wide. So it's a it's classic vein underground style system. Okay, great. Thank you. So, so James, uh, there is a question from a viewer uh, basically asking. What do you see as the potential for value re-rating? Can you comment on expected timing and expectations um, in terms of conservative goals in that respect? Well, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> talk about the forward-looking statement. Uh, it sure is. <laughs> so it, it's, uh, 
it's a difficult question to answer. Oh, you know, we have lots of leverage to the silver price. So if you're a believer in that, then also be driven uh, very largely by the drill results that we that we're going to be having at Columba. You know, we've got really high expectations there um, on Columba. We've got many, many veins, mul multiple veins with good widths and truly high grades, wide open for expansion. So we've we've got all the elements that's need you know, that we need, and so the things we control, as Eric touched on, as we, you know, we're executing on what we can control, what we cannot control is the metal price and when it's going to move and what direction. We certainly have firm beliefs in that, of course. So it, it's um, there's a lot of leverage there for a number of reasons. I, I'm, I'm not going to be able to quantify that, <laughs> Absolutely. unfortunately. <laughs> Um, one one other question, and uh, we've we've touched on this uh, earlier, but uh, with another company. But what is the selling price in the ground that um, you would estimate as as you know starting to make uh, a, a given project attractive in terms of a takeover? Well, you know, certainly we saw from Chen, <clears throat> Chen charts there of over enterprise values of. Two three dollars, and uh, those are pretty attractive prices. If we see silver busting through thirty dollars again, uh, which we believe we are going to see, and, and if it does that, then we believe it's going to make a pretty strong charge to its old highs. That's a different world. And when you get into a bull market like that one, we 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 saw last saw silver heading for fifty. That's a different world entirely. So your your multiples are going to be much different, as well. There, you know, we've got three companies on this panel here, all with really great silver projects. But don't let that fool you. There's not very many high quality silver projects out there on the, at the exploration discovery stage or even resource stage. So. That's another factor that will come to play at some point, just the scarcity of good silver projects. Yeah, I uh, thanks for that. I, I could not agree more. I mean, I I have a hard time when I when I'm I'm looking for new companies that I want to follow research and potentially, you know, consider adding to uh, the portfolio. It's tough. I mean, people uh, would be surprised, like you say, how how many uh, um, uh, silver projects uh, there are out there that are primarily silver. So much gets reported as silver equivalency, and that's a lot of times that's masquerading as as silver when when truly it is not. It's other metals, other or sometimes base metals, and uh, you're not getting what you think you're getting. <laughs> So I, I would caution uh, investors to keep that in mind. If your focus is silver, be very clear about um, the silver equivalencies, uh, what the value is if it's in the ground, what the revenues are uh, from silver if it's a producer. Uh, that's certainly something that you want to keep in mind. Um, one or two last questions that are more, more general questions, and, and I'll, I'll leave these open to pretty much anyone. Um, Although the silver majors might use their cash flow to acquire developers, um, might industry users, in particular PV or solar panel manufacturers, also try to take stakes in the silver miners in an effort to secure supply? So, I'll, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, Peter. Absolutely, I'll jump in no, there absolutely. Quick. I mean, Avino's had a relationship with Samsung for years, and uh, that's just the beginning. And the answer is yes times two. I mean, it's definitely going to happen. Whether it be PV manufacturers or not, I can't say with any certainty. What I can state with certainty is it'll happen. And again, I think the main thing, and it bears worth another minute, is you're going to get a synergistic effect in my view, which means as the monetary structure continues to unravel, so there's monetary demand for silver, there's also going to be more industrial demand for silver. So they're going to feed on each other. And if you get in a situation where you've got to have silver, you're out of business. 
you don't care because silver is price inelastic on the demand side. Because if you're building a new widget that takes a 0.1 ounce of silver to manufacture something that costs 5,000 bucks, you don't care if you're paying for $50 silver or $500 silver because it's only 0.1 ounce and your, your total cost is 5,000 for the unit. I hope I'm making that clear. So in a lot of applications for silver, it's the amount of silver is so small, it's price inelastic. It doesn't matter if silver is a 10,000 an ounce, we're going to buy it. There's nothing that's cheaper or could substitute for it. And this is something that most people overlook when they economically look at the industrial side of the silver equation. And that's something that I like to harp on. So I'll get off the high horse and give it back to you guys. <laughs> Well, that's great. No, I thanks thanks for that uh, insight. Uh, uh, could not agree more. Um, you know, I think you're right. So many people simply don't under under uh, simply underestimate the the difficulty to to substitute um, the uh, the price inelasticity. The fact that uh, you know more than seventy percent of of silver actually comes from mining other metals. Less than a quarter of silver actually comes from mining primarily silver. So the production of silver clearly depends on producing gold, silver, lead, and zinc. And so, um, you know, if if there are significant changes in those uh, in the production of those metals, well, the the silver supply will be affected. And if um, the price of silver were to, to to skyrocket, the the majority of the production of silver probably wouldn't change that much because the the miners of of uh, the companies that produce silver these you know uh, as a byproduct of these other metals uh, are happy to take the higher price but are going to do very little to change their output so that's your price inelasticity uh, one last question and again open to everyone but um here we go would it benefit shareholders if some of the explorers merged only suitable mergers where the where the, the eventual whole would be greater than the sum of the parts so that the combined assets would make a more attractive package to the producers. Chen, David, James, Joseph, open to everyone. I would Eric, say this. You're a former we, uh, analyst, go ahead. Yeah, we, we get that. We get that question a lot when we're when we're marketing, uh, particularly at the conferences and with institutional investors. There is a real hunger, a real desire out there to reduce the number of of stories out there, particularly in Mexican silver stocks. And that desire is there be created the definitive silver stock that people can invest in. But the problem is is that. When you're putting together two companies or three companies that each has a has a marquee project and they both need capital, that becomes a competition. Well, my project's better than yours, so my my project can get the, the money first, and and that's that's a ludicrous place to get to. What's better is if there's something synergistic, if there's a small producer that has a mine that has cash flow that is has got a short life and and not much on the exploration potential side that's a great merger potential where you then add as an explorer you add a pipeline to a producing company and that that cash flow can be used to advance the project rather than continually going back to the market in that typical death spiral that we see in the juniors yeah i also like to add if the two juniors are geologically you know, complement their land package, complement to each other. And a lot of times, I mean, I was just in Finland, right? They were building, Rupert had a big discovery, but their pit hole, you see, is very steep. And then they go into another company, Orient's line, B2. So those are actually very synergistic. Um, if potentially, I believe, potentially someone will, you know, will take over the whole area. So precisely what happened with gold in Nevada, right? Is putting together uh, Barrick and Newmont at the time for their Nevada assets. So you could capture the synergies that you just referred to where the, the pit walls are joining each other with a funny rib in between, it's crazy. So yeah, that it has to be one plus one equals something well more than two. Agreed, agreed. Um, again, I think uh, as uh, to kind of sum that up, the economics will, will determine. Um, dominate and determine what what eventually happens with with uh, the potential for uh, mergers and acquisitions uh, in in this in this space. Well, thank you everyone um, for your contribution. We're going to have to eventually we're we're there now. We're going to have to wrap things up. Um, I'd like to thank everyone who participated. The three companies. 
uh, outcrop silver uh, and gold and silver, um, GR silver and um, Kootenai silver. I'd like to thank uh, the Metals Investor Forum for hosting this silver webinar. I'd like to thank Chen Lin and David Morgan for uh, participating, presenting, and contributing. And I'd like to thank all of the uh, attendees who uh, who took their time, who uh, listened, who provided questions, and some great uh, made us think and made us uh, made us work to uh, provide hopefully some useful answers. And um, we certainly uh, would like to thank everyone for participating, and we look forward to do the, doing this uh, at some time again in the uh, the near future. Thanks to everyone, and I uh, wish you all a great after a great day, a great afternoon.